I have notes too. Just in case. Hello, my name is Kate Hudson Hall, and thank you for listening to Bulimia Sucks. So this is a platform for people to share relatable and uplifting and inspiring conversations based on bulimia and anorexia and other eating disorders. And episodes include their personal stories of where they, oh, where they were and then how they have moved forward and their journeys taken into recovery. And also we talk to professionals who work with people with eating disorders. So now, if you haven't heard about it, my audio book is live and it's live on Audible, Amazon and iTunes. And if you would be interested in like a free copy of this, free copy of this, I was getting a bit carried away with my word. <laughs> Please email me at katehudsonhall at gmail.com and I can send you the code so you can download it for free. And also the Bulimia Sucks program, program. So it's a Bulimia Sucks digital pack. So this is now available and it will show you how to take the steps forward in your recovery from your eating disorder. Now, what's included within the pack is eight plus hours of video content, a PDF of the book, my book, Bulimia Sucks, and also a hypnosis recording, an MP3 download, and a relaxation hypnosis recording for the times when maybe you're feeling a little stressed to be able to calm and relax you. A downloadable ebook for family and friends support for you to give your family and friends for them to have more, more of an insight into bulimia and to give them a bit of guidance. And also uh, included is access to um, the private Facebook group for ongoing support. And lastly, regular Facebook live Q&A sessions with myself. So if you would like more information, if you go to bulimiasucks.com, then you'll be able to find it all in there. Now, I'm very excited about our guest today. Our guest is called Beth Smeaton, and she is a life coach who specializes in helping women heal their relationship with food and their body so they can feel free to live their life. Oh, we need a lot of that. Everybody needs that. So Beth teaches women how to listen and trust their body, their body's wisdom, and then coaches her clients through any obstacles or challenges that may come, on, come along. So this work allows binge eating to be a distant memory and also has food decisions feel as effortless as brushing your teeth, no drama, no chatter. So Beth is here today to talk about after her 20 year experience of disorders, disordered eating, she discovered intuitive eating, which has helped her make peace with food. So welcome Beth. Thank you, Kate. Oh, it's fabulous to have you join us. Thank you for having me. Yay. <laughs> so now, so tell us about your disordered eating. Let's begin there. Sure. So it started when I was 16. I went on my first diet right. and fun stuff. <laughs> yes. Like so that many of us have done that before. Yes. Yes. And I, so I didn't realize I was struggling with disordered eating until way later, until I was in my thirties. Right. It felt like either I was restricting. So in my mind, that was healthy, like what we're told and taught to do, or I was out of control and yeah. out of control was like 
I felt like something was wrong with me. I didn't have enough discipline. I didn't have enough willpower. So it felt like this up and down roller coaster, always trying to lose weight, never happy, going to bed uncomfortably full, beating myself up, all the things. Yes. Those Uh, negative things we do to ourselves. Exactly. Exactly. And so that went on for 20 years until I realized, oh, hey, (laughs) something's up. You don't need to live your life this way. And I got help. And it was probably the best decision of my entire life. So what sort of help did you get initially? I I got help through life coaching myself, which is how I'm doing this work now. Uh, I knew, yeah, getting this help, I was like, I have to help others. So I received help from multiple life coaches and a group program. Uh, And a group program. Yeah, through the life coaching school. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So what did you learn? Oh my gosh. I learned essentially that my restriction was a coping mechanism. Uh, I was using restriction to not feel my feelings, to control my feelings, to try and control my life. Um, I learned that I was restricting in an effort to prove my worth and through my body and my body size. I didn't have that self-worth and thought, and again, this was like language I didn't realize at the time. This is now, um, but I didn't have the self-worth necessary to trust myself and to feel safe with myself. So those were some big learnings. Wow. Yeah. And how did you, becoming more aware of your self-worth, how did you do that? Such a great question. I remember the first question I was asked in regards to this, and it was so simple. It was, what do you love about yourself? And if you can't answer that, what do you like about yourself? My mind went blank. Oh, did I it? had no response. Right. I didn't even allow myself to look at myself that way. There was nothing I found that was good. So what helped was that I was asked, okay, what do your friends love about you? What do your family love about you? And I was able to answer that from that perspective and Mm. see, oh, okay. So I can start to see that too, but it, it wasn't instant. It was a lot of, you know, reprogramming, understanding and searching for those beautiful, amazing qualities that I do have Um, and continuing to find that evidence and how that was true. So that was really powerful work. So you said a lot of reprogramming. So what does that mean? Uh, Reprogramming in my brain. So (laughs) my brain would immediately go to the negative about myself uh, in, in the world and just in general. It was always negative. And so I had to use those negative thoughts as a cue to be like, wait, hold on. We're not thinking that way anymore. It was like this, a trigger to be like, wait, now name some things that are actually true. What are the facts? What are the positives? And so that practice was very helpful in reprogramming and creating essentially a new pathway in my brain where now it's like, of course, that's how I think instead of the negative. Yeah, absolutely. Creating that new neural pathway in your brain, but it's something you have to, you know, awareness is the first step, isn't it? Oh, this is the way I'm thinking negatively about myself or whatever it may be. This is the pattern. Okay. So I need to do something about this and I need to start to change. Now I'm aware I need to start to change the way I'm thinking about Mm -hmm. that specific. Yeah. Yeah. And do you remember specifically how you did that? Yes. I started a journal, keeping a journal, essentially, uh, it, I called it a worry journal <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I wrote down essentially like brain dumped everything that I was thinking to get that awareness. Cause we think so many thoughts over and over again, each day where it's on autopilot, we don't realize. So that journal was the best for my awareness to be like, 
whoa, this is, this is some crazy stuff happening in here. Yeah. I had to learn to also not judge or shame that and allow those thoughts to be, and it's okay, really comfort myself and have compassion and grace for myself there. That was big. I didn't, that was like learning how to build that muscle. That was very new and felt very foreign to me. Yes. Where Actually now being like, kind okay. to yourself. Yeah. Oh, and allowing yes. yourself to, to have these, these feelings. Yes. And so, yeah, that journal helped with the awareness piece. And then I would also take it a step further and think about what I wanted my life to look like after healing and just imagine myself in that space and imagine what I might be thinking, what I might be feeling, how I might be treating myself. And that allowed me to tap into just one small thing each day of how I could start treating myself that way and speaking to myself that way then. So over time, it became just what I did, but it was, it was some work to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of people aren't aware of how powerful their imagination is. Yes. And by creating that image of how you would like to be in the future. It's kind of setting the sea, but it's also directing your mind to start to think that way. Exactly. It's to reprogram it, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And allowing yourself to go there and to believe that it's possible. Mm. I think that's another huge part of it instead of like, oh, that won't happen for me because it just shuts us, our brains down. But yeah. when we allow our imagination and like dream again, it's like, oh, okay, this, this is actually fun. And it can be, and it is a fun process moving forward. Yes. Yeah. So I love the idea that you did the journaling and the kind of brain dumping. So in order for you to start to be aware of what the negative patterns were. So how long did you do that for before you, you know, did you do a week's worth or did you do it for a couple of days and then start to look back and. I did it every day for six months, but seriously three months. That was my daily practice. I made it like a non-negotiable. If I was serious about this, if I really wanted to recover and heal, that was something I could commit to. And it was, you know, five minutes. It wasn't anything major, Yeah. but it felt so good. I think that was, I resisted it for so long, but then once I started, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. Why would I not keep like continue doing this for myself? So it was great. Yeah. And a lot of my clients, they find that so powerful, writing down, journaling, mm -hmm. you know, if they've had a particularly difficult, stressful day, actually writing down all those thoughts and feelings just really helps them to move on from that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how else, what was, you know, what, what were the other steps that you took to move forward? So a bit, another big part for me was while working with coaches, they were able to essentially use like guided meditation. I don't really know how else to describe it, but guided meditation to do bring me back through childhood and to uncover and unlock the memories that I had within myself that <clears throat> just started this negative self-worth and the feelings that I felt as a child yeah. and trying to cover those up. So that through that guided process, I was able to essentially tap into my inner child and talk to her and feel her feelings and tell her what she needed to hear. Yeah. And that was like this beautiful, it always ended in tears, <laughs> but it was this beautiful process that taught me how to, again, speak kindly to myself, how to love myself, what that looked like, what that felt like. Um, it's something I help my clients with as well, but that was a major part in my healing as well. Yeah. Cause I practice, I don't know, something similar to that and it's called timeline therapy. Yeah. We go back yeah. along the timeline of our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And what is amazing about timeline therapy is 
So you can keep that past memory, difficult memory, maybe that's connected to that behavior, but you don't have the feelings linked to that experience. So mm -hmm. you can let them go. So you're free of that in order yes. to be able to feel more positive in your life in whatever way. So it's yes. a really powerful therapy, that one. Yeah. And key being the letting go part. I think there are always questions on how do I let go? How do I stop? And it's through that process where it, it just, it just allows you to do that, which. Yeah. Yeah. So you have like got magic. That, <laughs> it is like magic. I love time like that. So you haven't got that link, that mm -hmm. same link to, to those feelings. So you're, you've got the memory, but you haven't got the feelings that come up when you think about that specific experience whatever it may be yeah the meaning changes which yes. changes your current perspective yeah 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 and what sort of feelings came up for you what was your link in that situation oh uh, so much fear oh it was the fear so much fear yeah mm. i I was the child that was afraid of everything to the point of my parents joking and saying Oh, there's no, there goes Beth again. She's afraid of whatever, which, you know, growing up, it was funny, but as I was doing this work, I'm like, wait, that's maybe not so funny. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, I had to, my biggest path was learning how to feel safe within my body, within my mind and within my emotions, that feeling of safety was huge to counteract the fear and to not let fear drive all of my actions. Right. And how did you do that? Uh, that was, <laughs> yeah, no, that was, no, I'm not like, I'm just thinking back. The sigh is like, oh, it's just the power in it is where that sigh is coming from. And Feeling safe came from learning how to process my emotions. I thought I was an emotional person at the time, but I was not feeling my emotions. Again, going back to the safety, I didn't feel safe to feel. Uh, I didn't know what it meant to process my emotions. So I, I learned that talking through them and learning that my emotions were just communicating to me. It wasn't anything to be afraid of, to just listen. What are my, what are those communi what are those emotions saying yeah. to help me understand my true needs and desires? Um, so a lot of deep listening to myself, getting to know myself better, understand myself better, um, as well as learning how to ground myself. That was with that safety piece. If uh, I was feeling super triggered and anxiety. That was something where I had this body response where I couldn't stop uh, feeling that anxiety. So learning practices that worked for me to bring myself back to the present, you know, regulate my body, regulate my mind, reminding and myself. What, what practices at that particular point did you? I you was do? doing... Um, well, journaling, even like that also was a practice to ground myself, uh, walking outside, getting out in nature to really get all of my senses involved. So what I was seeing, hearing all those things, uh, running was another practice and oddly enough, grocery shopping <laughs> was another practice because it basically it was task oriented that I, it was like something I knew I could do and I knew I could complete. Um, and all the stimulation that you get at a store with the colors and the people and you know, what they're saying and stuff yeah. like that. So that was another practice that was helpful for me to just kind of ground myself in reality. Yeah. Yeah. So another good way to do would be to practice mindfulness in those sort of situations. Mm -hmm. yeah yes definitely and stop all that negative chitter chatter mm -hmm. yeah so much of it <laughs> yes I think that we all have don't we well we have 60,000 different thoughts that fly through our mind every day so mm -hmm. you know, the majority of those are connected to feelings and some of the forefront some are in the background and we're just most of them we're 
just not aware of until we find ourselves with our head in the biscuit tin lid, you know, biscuit tin or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love this. Um, And so how did you, how were you aware of your behavior changing as you learned about yourself? Oh my gosh, that, that, those changes happened way quicker than I ever imagined, um, which was fun to experience. Uh, But I was feeding myself enough food. I was no longer afraid of my hunger. Uh, That felt safe to eat. So as soon as I was eating enough, that helped with the binge eating from restriction. And then as soon as I was starting to uncover my emotions and essentially speak to myself, speak to those emotions that helped stop the emotional binge eating as well. So those two new habits were just life-changing. So yeah, it was amazing to no longer be tied to the scale and not be tied to an app tracking everything I ate. I used to, um, rely on apps in the scale to tell me what and how much or if I could eat. So not having that anymore and trusting myself was like, oh, it was so freeing and it still is and it's the best. <laughs> Absolutely. And tuning into your body. Mm-hmm. So how did you tune in and, and work with your emotions at that particular point? So tuning in, I used reminders on my phone to tune in, to remind myself very simply the question I asked myself and now that I pass on to all of my clients is, is my here and now body hungry? It's so simple and it just allows you to pause and check in and be like, oh, okay, am I, what, what are the different nuances of my hunger and to get curious about your body rather than like following these external rules. So the check-ins, those daily multiple per day, per day check-ins are what helped me start to tune in and to trust. And over time, those new experiences helped me to fully trust myself and not be afraid of my body or think that my body was broken or that it was like out to get me. I think, you know, that was a main thought when I was binge eating was like, my body is like against me. Yeah. So uh, really seeing how my body wanted me to live and thrive and feel good was like, again, like just life-changing. It's, there's no other way (laughs) to describe it. Going from one extreme to this absolute and complete freedom is, it's still so fun to think about and look back and reflect on because of the change. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you use the hunger scale. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, cause I, I teach weight loss courses also. And the hunger scale is a real great guide for people to be able to tune in to themselves and figure out where they would be on that hunger scale. Zero was when you're empty. This is the way I do it. I think there's different mm-hmm. ways of doing it. And 10 was when you were just so full up. And then it's tuning in and only eating between uh, four, five, and six on that hunger scale. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, not getting below four because that's Mm -hmm. kind of a danger zone because then you get too hungry and we know what happens then. Mm -hmm. And then anything above six, it's like, well, I say to my clients, what I want you to do is I want you to ask yourself. So I know that I'm not hungry for this food, whatever it may be. So what feelings am I trying to change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. And even so along that same, I use that scale too. And giving the permission, if you go higher than a six, allowing yourself like it's okay, but then similar journal about it and think about, okay, what happened there and get curious. Don't beat yourself up. It's okay. And then what can you learn from that? And those learnings are what add up so exponentially over time where it's like, oh, okay. It doesn't feel, it just feels effortless to yeah. tune in because you've learned so much about yourself throughout the process yeah mm-hmm. so tell us tell us more 
Beth, about the intuitive eating? What do you want to know? <laughs> How it works, because people there be a lot of people that don't know. Okay, yeah. So intuitive eating is essentially eating as self-care. That's like the most basic way I like to describe it. Um, honoring your hunger, honoring your fullness, honoring your satisfaction. So honoring your true needs and desires, eating what you like to eat and feeling good about it. Also thinking about thinking about how you want to feel, how you want this food to feel in your body and afterwards. So taking this holistic approach to food and using yourself as a guide rather than diets and rules and regulations and yeah. I think because most people know that they are, well, majority of people that are trying to become slimmer are still looking for that magical diet and there yes. isn't one. Yep. That was my whole thing. I always wanted to find yeah. that perfect way to eat always. Yeah, absolutely. And there is no magical diet. Nope. nope. There's no such thing. People Our need... bodies change every day. Yeah. Our needs change every day. People need to start to tune into their own body and mm -hmm. listen to mm -hmm. the signals. Yeah. Beginning like with... To, with the signals, I think something that was helpful for me. So if this is helpful for your listeners with our body cues, like hunger and fullness with eating disorders and disordered eating, you're so afraid of them it, and you don't trust them. No. And, but when you think about them as like, when we have to pee, it's the same, it's a bodily function. We don't, we're not afraid of that. We know it's there to tell us something. And so when we can start to see, oh, hunger and fullness, those are the same cues, just, just like going, needing to pee. Like when we take the emotion out of it and see yeah. the facts for what of it, what it is, it's like, oh, okay, it's way more approachable and attainable that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that so many people are in the pattern of having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. And, you know, even, you know, come lunchtime, even though they've had a big cake or something at 11 o'clock come one o'clock they're like oh everybody's going for lunch oh come on yeah it's lunchtime let's have lunch and not mm -hmm. actually tuning into their body exactly asking themselves exactly. That, where would I be on that hunger scale or am I actually hungry for this food they just go ahead exactly. and eat yes yeah it's like autopilot style mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 so now, what advice would you give somebody that has disordered eating? Uh, to find all the help you can, whatever that looks like, whether that's therapy, coaching, support groups, reading books, like you do not have to do this alone. And it's so much easier with help. So asking for help is the number one thing I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And so going back to when you had, when you were in the depths of your disordered eating, so what, what were your reasons for recovering? Yeah, my story. So again, at the time I didn't necessarily identify, I'll say this, I didn't admit to myself that I had a problem mm. and what happened for me was I had was struggling for the 20 years, wasn't necessarily admitting or realizing that's what was going on. Uh, I had started health coaching in a way that was having women track everything they were eating, weigh their food, weigh themselves. Because at that time for me, that was, I felt free in that I was under super control. <laughs> But what was really happening was this extreme control. I was, my binge eating was at its worst. So it was almost like, I just felt, oh, it just was very uncomfortable. And my friend from college came to me and asked me to work together. And that conversation was the cue for me to admit to myself that something was wrong because I knew I couldn't take her on as a client. Right. Like, this doesn't feel right. So it's because it didn't feel right. <laughs> mm -hmm. I felt like I, it felt like if I were um, 
teaching, if I had kids, if I had a daughter or a son, if I were teaching them this behavior, would I want them weighing their food? No. So that was the realization that I needed and, you know, how I was able to admit to myself, okay, you need help. (laughs) And so that's what led me to be like, okay, it's time to recover. It's time to heal. It might be scary. It's okay. (laughs) That's really interesting. So even though that you were down that path, you knew it wasn't right. Yeah. There was a part of me that just knew. And, you know, going back to that fear, I was, I was letting fear take control. And since it was only affecting me, I was like, oh, it's fine. Or I didn't admit it to myself because I was too scared of what might happen if I let go of my extreme control. Um, Yeah. But that experience was like, might be scary. You got to do it though. It's time. Yeah. Yeah. And for the listeners, um, what specific suggestions would you give, you know, or um, specific resources would you suggest for some, some, somebody? Uh, Definitely intuitive eating the book um, that I probably read at least two or three times (laughs) over and over again to, start to, again, reprogram my brain to understand and unlearn the diet rules and restriction that I had been doing for 20 years. And so, the scales, did you throw your scales away? Yep. Good, good, yep. good. That's what everybody should do. Throw mm-hmm. the scales away. Absolutely. Oh, that power that scale had. Um, I also read Health at Every Size. That was another book that was very helpful to understand that my body size didn't determine my health. Right. So it was huge. Um, let's see other powerful things. The journaling highly suggest Yeah, that's a new practice and the learning how to regulate your body and emotions is another huge, powerful suggestion that I think anyone can benefit from to change their life and understand themselves on a deeper level and take care of themselves. Yeah. 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 So interesting. So, um, with regards to where you are now and your life coaching. So tell us about that. Yeah. So I work with women one-on-one and it is the most fulfilling thing. (laughs) I love, I look forward to every session with all of my clients, whether it's celebrating a breakthrough or it's like holding space and supporting them with whatever they're challenged with that day. It is just the best. I love, and I'm so grateful for all of my clients. It is just the best career I could ever ask for. And how, how does the program work? So I really have my clients focus on their future selves and building out that vision and feeling safe to dream that that's possible. And I also teach them how to become attuned with their body. So, you know, to trust and honor their hunger, fullness and satisfaction. So giving them tools and processes and strategies to do that. And so they become an expert essentially in their body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we identify any triggers that are coming up. So whether that's emotional or diet mentality or anything that's getting in the way of trusting their body or honoring their body, we'll uncover those things and work through their challenges so that by the end, they can't even imagine going back to how they were before. It's so fun. Amazing. And is it a, a, um, a set program or is it, you know, over so many week period or is it? We, yes, we work together for six months at a time right. and we speak for about an hour every week. Excellent. Yeah. And it's really tailored to them because uh, before each session, I have them fill out like, okay, what can we celebrate this week? What are you struggling with? So that they are getting the exact help that they need each week. 
Amazing. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. And so if somebody wanted to find out more, how could they how could they do that? Where would they have to go? We'll put the links anyway, but if you could tell the listeners. Uh, my website is bethsmeetoncoaching.com. And I also have Instagram and TikTok and my handles there are at Beth Smeaton. Okay, excellent. Um, and it, so it's got all the details about the course. And, exactly. And what it entails and specifics. Yes. And there's a link to sign up for a call so we can chat and get to know each other ahead of time. Yeah. And is it uh, mostly online? It's all through phone calls. Oh, okay. And is it yeah. Zoom as well? So, or? Not, we don't use Zoom actually. Yeah. It's just phone calls. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. When mm -hmm. I first went, went into recovery from bulimia, well, one of the first things I did was the, um, the Eating Disorders Association over here, I got in contact with them, uh, probably on the telephone, or maybe I wrote to them in the post, um, and because it was a very long time ago. And um, they, what they did was that they, they sent me a booklet each week to fill out, um, and then I would have to send it back to them. And then I would speak to somebody for an hour, a therapist for an hour, and we would go through the booklet, the weeks, uh, the week before's booklet. And then, um, yeah, so that's kind of how the program worked, which was really interesting because now it's kind of like very old fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> you get back and forth and like <laughs> talking about the week before when, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that was really powerful for me. And I always remember they sent me, because I had no idea how to eat whatsoever. Yeah. I couldn't even eat an apple. Mm -hmm. um, and they sent me a breakdown of what I should eat. And I remember looking at that thing. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe this, how much they expect me to eat. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing because it was a real guide to how normal people eat. Mm -hmm. oh yeah. God. I should be eating. And I just remember that was so fascinating. It was really powerful for me. I oh, thought I'd throw awesome. that in there. It yes, was. that's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So now, Beth, is there anything else that you would like to add? Just for anyone listening to know that they're not alone and they're not broken. I think that's such a big thought that is like, yeah. I'm broken. My body's broken. It's not, you do have cues that your body is telling you, you can learn them. So it's okay. Just letting everyone know it's okay. You'll get through this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's learning how to, to do that and mm -hmm. having the tools to be able to work with those difficult triggers maybe that come up. Yeah. And I, I like to equate learning how to listen to your body, like learning a new language. So there's no expectations on needing to know right away or overnight. It's like, it yeah. takes time and that's okay. And it takes practice, but the good thing is we eat multiple times a day. That's so many times that we get to practice. Yeah. So when we look at it that way, it's like, oh, okay, I'm this, this is going to happen. It's inevitable that it'll happen. Yeah. And, you know, for many people, those patterns, those negative patterns and habits have been there quite often from when people are young so mm -hmm. it's not going to happen overnight it's something that exactly. gradually needs to be developed mm -hmm. and that neural pathway to grow in the brain yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> because you can do it absolutely and yeah absolutely and it's just it's it's so powerful to be able to tune into your body and and uh, and understand that how powerful the body is mm -hmm. yep and then mm. it's there to take care of us not out to get us <laughs> and it tells us yeah we just need to tune in exactly yes well there thank you so much this has been you, excellent Kate. yes so interesting for people to learn about intuitive eating and how it works and to have all your links which will be put below 
for people to come and find out more on your website and connect with you. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Yay. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, great. So that's that's all for today's episode of Bulimia Sucks. And make sure that you come back and, and join us again for the next episode. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Apple iTunes. You never miss an episode. And as I mentioned earlier, check out my book, Bulimia Sucks, which is available on Amazon to learn many different techniques to help you begin to break through your painful bulimic behaviors. And there is a section in there about intuitive eating, if you'd like to know more from there. <laughs> and I'd love to know what you think. So leave me a review. That would be amazing. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to chatting with you in the next episode. <laughs>